Jared Poland Fronos Photo. Dot com here with Raw Talk episode number 40. I'll make sure I try to get that right each week. For some reason, I keep getting the numbers messed up, Stephen. I don't know why. Ari gets me right. It says 40. So on this week's episode, we have the largest guest we've ever had. Not large in size, but just the most famous photographer that we've had on, I believe. We have Bob Gruen coming up. Ari and I went up to New York City to sit in Bob's studio to basically hear amazing stories for over a half an hour about working with John Lennon and Ike and Tina Turner. It's fantastic. So we're going to we're gonna do an intro to that coming up. Uh, but before we do that, Stephen. Yes, sir. It's time for your new Stephen's News. Pro News. Whoa. Hello, Stephen. Like that? That's going to be my new intro. That's fantastic, <laughs> Stephen. Uh, what do we have this week? A bunch of stuff, actually. Some some pretty in-depth articles that we got to talk about this week. Some important stuff. Uh, first off, Apple did the whole WDCC thing this week, which is huge. We got iOS 7 coming out. It's going to be in the fall time. They're going to do the revamp of the photo app, the stock photo app, which has been the same for since like the first gen- generation iPhone. Uh, basically, what it's going to do, it's going to now allow for Instagram-style cropped square images, which... <laughs> Yeah, I agree. None of your 3-2 aspect ratio anymore. And filters. It's going to be one-to-one. They're going to apply live filters to photos, like you said. You're still going to be able to access the panorama feature. Uh, they're also going to have a new feature called Moments, which is going to be kind of like uh, Flickr's collections and sets. So basically, it's going to have an organizational system that will let you organize each photo by year, date, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And it'll be a lot easier to find photos that you took you know, two years ago instead of following through you shouldn't your have photos, photos on your phone from two years ago though. well the thing is with at least with mine because i was from the original 3g i have photos all the way back from them which i need to get off my phone yeah you do it's pretty bad it, it, the app looks fine it's an update the whole ios 7 looks cool i know Ari's yeah, running good. it right now he's testing it out and it, it looks cool i mean the features are updated but let's move on from there yeah uh next up new mac pro that, huge upgrade i was sitting here and there were and, and i said this last week yeah i said it to to adam or i said it to ari i was like Apple, why don't they just come out with a smaller Mac Pro? I said, it doesn't need to be the big cheese grater size one that they had before because nobody does any of this. Inter- you don't really need to upgrade internally anymore. Mm-hmm. Everything's done externally through the Thunderbolt and, and USB 3.0. And then look at that. I was watching the show. I was sitting here during lunch for an hour and a half watching the keynote on my Apple TV. And they were like, we're going to talk about the Mac Pro. And then they start showing. I'm like, oh, my God, it's going to be round. I'm like, is it going to be round? I'm like, it's round. It's a trash can. Yeah, it's a trash can. <laughs> but who cares? It looks, I mean, the power that is built into this thing, all solid state, yeah. all flash memory. It's insane. Small, 9.9 inches by 6 point whatever inches. 12 cores. 12 core. Crazy. Sen- uh, sensors. 12 core processors. And you just, 12 core processor. And you just, no, it's multiple processors. I don't even know. But I think it's up to 12 cores Well, we're, uh, or something like people that. People are asking me, what do I think the price is going to be? I'm going to venture to say $39.99 is going to be the base model price with going up from there to like $49.99, $59.99, and $60, depending on this, how much memory you want in it. Uh, but don't forget, we got all those Drobos that we can store out externally and have all that extra yeah. stuff. Um, it, I think it's going to be really awesome. The fact is, for professional photographers, especially ones that shoot on location... You don't need to really take a laptop. Mm-mm. You can take your Mac Pro with you, get a Pelican case, throw it in there gently, uh, and <laughs> you just take a monitor. Uh, or it could be any t- it could be a TV for God's sake, and you're good to go. Yeah. So and um, it, it was much needed to that upgrade. Oh, it's been ten it's, years. Yeah. But it, it looks good. Uh, uh, the, the specs look amazing, and I can't wait. I mean, for video processing, for just everything, it looks like it's going to be the winner. It's going to be an insane work machine. Yeah. Uh, next up, Lightroom 5, another big announcement. Adobe has released the final version of it. Do you know what pisses me off, Stephen? What? What pisses me off is I noticed this a couple days, a week before they came out with the new Lightroom. The fact that there's people out there pushing, like Scott Kelby, for example. Mm-hmm. We'll use him as an example. I don't just want to call out anybody. We'll call out Scott Kelby while we're at it because <laughs> I'm trying to get on his podcast. Um, now I'm going to rip on him. He's pushing that, hey, look, this is on sale. This is the lowest price I've ever seen Lightroom. Oh, you should get it. It's For four, it's, you mean, right? Yeah, for Lightroom yeah. four. It's like save 50 some dollars, save $60. It's like $98 or 80 some dollars. And then 
He knows that the other one's coming. He is. He may not know the exact date, but you got to know that when they drop the price and they're running major sales and specials, that that means the other one's around the line. And the update's only 79 bucks, which means if you bought Lightroom 4 last week, it's going to cost you more than if you waited to buy Lightroom 5. Yeah. So you're pretty much screwed if you did that. <laughs> I, I just I just get a little upset when people. I, I didn't push it out. I did. I I got stuck when I did it in three. I pushed out Lightroom three for people, but the difference was when Lightroom three came out, it was three ninety nine, and then it was on sale for one hundred and fifty bucks. And then it dropped down to ninety nine, didn't it? Well, we didn't know that they were gonna. It was a little less, but we didn't know that they were gonna drop Lightroom four to like a week later. Yeah, a week later. So you know, I I. A lot of people bought it when I pushed it out. I didn't fall for it again this time. <laughs> I didn't. But We're not getting what, you this time. What are the main features? Uh, main features is a ton of new stuff. It's much faster, apparently. It doesn't load like well, here, slow I'm, as hell like Lightroom 4. I'm interrupting you again. God, people you're people yell at me. me. But yeah, yeah Lightroom 4, <laughs> the time between 3 and 4, well, I believe, was much longer. I think they really screwed up Lightroom 4 in the, in, in the forefront because it has always been slow and laggy. Since it was actually, I feel like it was slower than Lightroom 3 when it I first was got it. It like, still is slower. Yeah. It got a little faster, but anyway, they pumped out five features. Uh, like I said, much faster. Um, it'll update your Lightroom 4 catalogs like usual features when we get to that. Uh, the upright tool, there's a new one called, it basically allows fixing horizons. So let you fix your horizon lines versus blah, cropping blah, yourself blah, manually. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> it fixes tilts, all that kind of stuff. So it's found in Shoot your lens straight. correction module. Yeah, get the stuff straight in the module. first front. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, you should have it right in the camera in the first place. As much um, as possible. The radial filter, they have that now. It allows you to alter different parts of the photo selectively, uh, similar, similar to like the adjustment brush, but yeah. I guess it's a different kind of version. Uh, the advanced healing brush, it's going to uh, be similar to the content aware fill that does in Photoshop. So that'll be pretty nifty. Adam's Instead of having been using it. Yeah, instead of having me, to, you know, jump over to Photoshop, you can just have it right in Lightroom Well, that's, that's the thing about Lightroom 5 is that a lot of the Photoshop features have been coming over now to Lightroom. So you don't have to jump into the Creative Cloud or into uh, Photoshop. Adam says that the the new, I haven't downloaded, I haven't purchased it yet. I mm -hmm. I, um, I will. I'm just waiting. Um, but he said that the, the healing brush is fantastic. And it was fantastic in Photoshop to begin with. So yeah. now that they bring that over, now that you can't just do, like, you're not relegated to just doing spots. You can do lines and everything. It's going to be much better off. Much better. Um, next up, we have the visual spot, which allows you to... This is pretty nifty for anyone who has that D600 who apparently has a lot of sensor issues. Uh, it'll let you clean up any sensor dust or other problems that you see in the image. It basically changes your image to like a black and white image, shows more contrast. You can see little spots. If your sensor is dirty, you know when to clean it, blah, blah, blah. That's cool. Yeah, it's pretty nice. Uh, and again, just the pricing difference... Um, it's $149 brand new, $79 if you want to upgrade. And also has another new feature actually that I forgot to mention, Smart Preview, which this is pretty nice. It'll let you edit pictures on the go so you don't need to actually bring an external hard drive with all the images on there or all the raw files. What it'll do is it'll create a pretty big, large preview file that's big enough to edit on. And then when you get back, you can do that on the go. And then when you get back home, you can reconnect to your hard drive, which will then use the original image and basically you have all those edits that you did, say, at a hotel room or something like that instead of starting over. So that's pretty nifty. It's interesting. Yeah, it's, it's, I'm curious, it's decent for people though, on the go. Are you editing a JPEG there? It's a preview. Is they, it different than the raw file? That, I'm not sure exactly. I mean, there's like a minute video describing right. it. But all hopefully right. it's the raw file. Who knows? All right. Anyway, hold on one second, Stephen. Yeah. I want to talk about, do you know this company's name? Rokinon? Rokinon. Have you heard people say it? They're like Rokinon. 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 Rokoko. The name is simple. It's Rokinon. It's spelled R O K I N O N. Now, I've seen these lenses at Alan's camera. Yeah. Uh, he's had them. I've never used them because they're a lot manual focus lenses. But what they're putting out is quality lenses that are like they have Cine lenses. They have, oh, by the way, this is, they're, they're a sponsor for this one. I'm just going to say it because it sounds like one. So, yeah, I want to thank them for doing that. Uh, we're bringing awareness to Rokinon. Rokinon. <laughs> R O K I N O N. Check out their Facebook page. But really, what they are, they, and, it's high quality lenses that are affordable. They're manual focus, but they talk to your cameras, but they don't auto focus. They have Cine lenses, which are pretty damn cool. Like you can set it up to your uh, Zacuto finder and the Zacuto uh, nice. the rigs that they have, and it can turn it, connect with that and have those things go. So it's a less expensive but quality option for yeah. Cine lenses. And if you do still images, if you do say things that aren't moving like landscapes, 
then you could use a manual focus lens for that. I mean, I'm not going to use it for shooting concerts. Yeah, because yeah, I just obviously, yeah. I can't keep up with it. But I know the Rokinon just came out with like a a, a $999 tilt shift lens, 24 millimeters. I mean, you're shooting. You don't really need to worry about autofocus there, so that would be kick ass for that. I love uh, those tilt shift videos too. Oh, the tilt they're shift so videos rad. are great, and that's that's one of the main features of these lenses is that they're great for video. Yeah, it's affordable. Eighty five one four thirty five. They got a one four, and they have a one point five T, which is for the cinema lenses. So anybody out there doing video, check out the Rokinon stuff. Alan's got them. Go to Rokinon, uh, Google Rokinon, and go to their Facebook page. They've got a lot of followers, and they, and they have a, a very dedicated following. R-O-K-I-N-O-N. Don't mistake them for anything. It's Rokinon. We should do a song about it. No. Back to news. <laughs> Back to news. Uh, Justin Bieber, he's all over the news, as usual, when it comes to photographers. Apparently, he's out to get every one of them. Uh, he stole a photographer's memory card. First, he stole the camera. He didn't steal it. Well, his I should say his bodyguards, his his pimps stole him. Um, basically, they stole the camera at first. He told them to grab the camera. The photographer cried about it, which I would too if they stole my camera. And then he got it back. And then Justin Bieber was like, steal his SIM card, he called yeah, it. SIM card. Steal the SIM card. Get a SIM card. I got your SIM card. Is that Canadian for memory card? Apparently. I don't know. No, no offense, Pascal. No offense. Um, but uh, yeah, he took the memory card. And he said, the photographer was like, you know, I'm going to delete the images. Give me it back, blah, blah, blah. And First off. Basically, Biebs took it. He stole it. Biebs, so he didn't do it. I mean, this, this stuff about did. telling his bodyguards to go take people's cameras. One, you can't go steal people's cameras. Physically take property. it out of their hands yeah. and then take their memory cards. Does he think he's, jo uh, does he think that he's Jeffrey Baratheon? Does he think he's in Game of Thrones that he can just rule people around and say, I could have your head. <laughs> I am the king. And then the king's like, well, anybody who has to say that I am the king uh, really doesn't have any power. So go to bed. But yeah, what, what, what does he think he is? He, Somebody needs to put him in his place. What I don't understand is that, I mean, he's he's in the public eye now. He's You're allowed to shoot him. He's in the street when he's, when they're shooting him. Everything's, you know, obviously legal while Get they're doing life, it. Get a life, kid. Yeah. Like, I, I, res I, I wasn't a big, I'm not a big Bieber fan. I respected what he was doing, you know, what they built in the music industry, doing that and building up something very successful. But he was quiet then. And now that he's 19 and a artist, quote unquote, he's a scumbag piece of crap who's just needs to get his face pummeled in by somebody. His ego is huge now. It's Relax. way too big for someone that's 19 years old. Like that's all he's known from his whole, you know, entire just life. Just pretty taking, much. Taking, he's got to chill, chill and taking people's stuff. They need to just, they need to, they need to arrest him. Yeah. They need to arrest him and the security guards because any security guard, I mean, are you kidding me? And I listen to the audio. It's like, I'm not going to ask you again. You're not going to ask me again to do what? I'm in public. You're in public. Take my camera. Go ahead. Break my camera. Punch me in the face. I'll call the cops. Awesome. Now you have a you're lawsuit. Screwed. Now you're going to pay me a couple hundred grand to go away. Yep. It's like, give me a break. Grow up, you little kid. He's and just asking for it. Like, yeah, he, he's asking for it. Screw him. And there, there's actually audio of the entire uh, 911 call from the photographer. You too, have that on online. the page? Yeah, that's on the page. Uh, and just going back to him, there was another incident. That wasn't the only one this past week. He also assaulted, well, his body cards, I should say again, assaulted a photographer. They choked him out. When he was, they were taking the guy was taking a picture of Bieber. Bieber's like, get him, choke him, blah blah blah. And uh, yeah, he, now he that that's king. even worse. He thinks he's king. Yeah, that's not legal. You can't do you that. You can't kind of just stuff. do that. You're not above the law. Just because you have bodyguards doesn't mean you're like the president. You know what we should do to him? Send him back to Canada. Send him back. I mean, I, I don't care. I don't care that he's here. Maybe he has citizenship. He owns a lot here. He pays a lot of taxes. He li doesn't he live in L.A.? Yeah, he's got a house there. I, I don't know if he has dual and citizenship. I should say this, too. Uh, I was watching some TV show the other day, and they said that they make he makes everyone everyone that steps in his house sign a confidential, I saw that. confidentiality or whatever. Report. I don't have a problem with that. But your friends, how do you, you don't trust your friends enough to not leak information well, that you're yes, talking you're about? Right. You shouldn't worry That's about some your friends. trust issues right there. But you shouldn't be having random people in your house that you have to worry about. I agree about. If, if Bob the Landscaper came in. That's Yo, a different whoa, story. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Bob the Landscaper is a great guy. <laughs> Bob is a good guy, I guess. But I'm saying you don't know him as well as your best friend, little Jimmy over there. <laughs> Little Jimmy. <laughs> little Jimmy and little Johnny. And, All right. Any other any other Billy. news this week? Because uh, Justin yeah, but, Bieber is a, <laughs> is a piece of crap at this point. Yeah. You know, stop. Just, I will say he, he gave me a awesome shots, though, when I shot him last in concert. Well, I got great shots, yeah. too. He, he, he's a performer. I will say he that. He is a performer, and he looks like a little twerp. He needs to get some muscle on his body so he can back his own stuff. But I loved... All right, screw him. We're Next not going to even go into Moving this. Moving on. Uh, photographer Joe McNally, he climbed the tallest building, which was awesome, the Burj Khalifa in Dubai. Uh, he, he basically climbed all the way to the top, 
And there's a GoPro video of him doing it from the bottom to the top, yep. showing him all the way to the tippy top. And the workers are hanging off the cliff. And he wouldn't—he didn't want just like landscape or, or, yeah, on the spire. Um, not cliff. Uh, but he didn't want just your normal landscape kind of pictures. He actually photographed the workers hanging out doing their everyday job. He was, he was you know, a photojournalist. Did you basically. hear how many pictures he took? Uh, I heard the shutter. Is it that was what you're like saying? Non- it's just like, like, it's like uh, okay. Spraying and praying. Let me get one good one. Um, and it's cool because like, like I said, the whole thing is behind the scenes video film with the GoPro. There's so many things you can do with that GoPro. Uh, and apparently to get access to the roof, you need the blessing of the prime minister of Dubai and a security clearance that could take up to three years to get. So yeah. somehow he got that. Yeah. Just I, ask, I guess he's got it in. Yeah. You shall receive. Is that um, all we have for news? We have more. Oh. We have more. How it's are we doing a, with it's time? It's a big news day. Uh, we we're good. We're about 15 minutes in the Reno rodeo. They oh, banned yeah. professional cameras. Uh, basically anyone from bringing them in, which is understandable at a certain extent. The policy prohibits spectators from bringing in video cameras or professional cameras with detachable lenses. Uh, I the, love how they tell you that a professional camera has detachable lenses. Yeah. Give me a freaking break Yep. at this point. Because you can get... Whatever. Go ahead. Anyway, the int- intended target, apparently, they're saying this, that uh, the ban is for animal rights activists. They're saying that they claim it's intended to prevent them from exposing abuses. That's what the animal rights abuses. activists are saying. Yeah, which is an interesting point of view. Um, yeah, the animal rights activists are saying that they're claiming that this is because of them. They're, they're trying to stop them from exposing the animals being hurt on the job, blah, blah, blah. But uh, the rodeo publicist defended the policy and basically she's saying that a, it's a copyright protection measure. Uh, it's to prevent to prevent unauthorized distribution and selling of in- images of rodeo stars, if, which I didn't know there was rodeo first stars. Off, if, you're, if, you're watch, if you're listening on the radio, <laughs> sorry, to the podcast, I've been sitting here shaking my head. That is a bunch of bullshit. I agree. Bullshit from the rodeo. Bullshit, I, I It's just like, is that it, Steven? No, we got one more. All right, hold on. Uh, that is a bunch of crap. I, the, the fact that you're going to say that the copyright stuff, that's like what they say with concerts. Nobody is going to take your image and sell it. You're a road. Give me a break. It's ridiculous. Next. Uh, next up, another sensor story. Fujifilm and Panasonic, they joined forces. They created an image sensor that apparently is double the dynamic range of the best sensor on the market today, which is a D800. Um, basically, they claim it's 29.2 stops of dynamic range, which is crazy. That's like HDR. Yeah, it basically is. It's going to start capturing great images. That's uh, compared color. to the D800, which has 15.3 stops. That's just so, and your average camera, I think, only has like thirteen or something like. I think my Mark III has like thirteen or fourteen. 13, yeah. yeah, I know Canon's a lot less than uh, Nikon. Um, anyway, they're saying the sensor is said to prevent highlight clipping in bright scenes and capture vivid and texture rich image in low light. Sure. Which again, HDR that pretty much describes it, it, that. But it's what your eyes are going to see, so yeah. they're going to start to it's get more realistic. Better. It's not going to look fake like HDR. It's going to be a realistic image because it's yep. capturing more of what the scene looks like. They're saying each pixel is going to be large enough to uh, capture one point two times the sensitivity of light versus your normal uh, sensor. Sounds and good. then they're saying it could hit the market very soon uh, compared to your the thousand times sensor uh, that we talked about last week on that podcast. Yep. So hopefully this will this will come soon in the next few years. We'll see. All right, Stephen. And that's about it for this week's photo news. Thank you for the photo news. I'm going to continue welcome, on. You're going to check the cameras. Yes, I am. And uh, thanks for your news. No problem. The Justin Bieber. What a joke at this point. Somebody needs to put him in his place. Anyway... Before we jump into the Bob Gruen uh, interview, which is fantastic, I want to let you guys out there know that coming up in a a few weeks, there is going to be an hour and a half bonus podcast that is only available if you are a subscriber to the podcast. If you are on iTunes and you hit the subscribe button, you will automatically get this when it goes live. Uh, It's not going to go up on YouTube. So if you are a subscriber, the only way to get it is to Listen to the podcast wherever you look. go on your podcast networks, whether it's YouTube, whether it's Stitcher. Uh, there's, there's many different podcast networks, but please subscribe on iTunes because what happens on every Monday that we have a podcast at noon Eastern Standard Time, the podcast goes live and then you're the first one to get it and we will be doing uh, contests and things like that for the people who listen early. Uh, but yeah, this Antonelli Institute thing is really going to be good. It's an hour and a half of me just laying down the law to the students and letting them know what they're in for and answering their questions. So coming up right now, we got the Bob Gruen interview. I want to let you know uh, it was fantastic. I want to really thank him and his people for allowing us to come up there and sit with him and just hear his awesome stories. You can check out his books. He's got John Lennon, The New York Years, 
this is a fantastic book where he spent, I believe he was a personal photographer for John Lennon and Yoko for, for nine years. Fantastic book, amazing photos in here. And then the other one is Rock Scene. Rock Scene is a larger book, heavier. It's all on Amazon. They are not very expensive. You can pick them up. Uh, really awesome stories in here and, and awesome photos. So now it is time to get to the best, well, the largest, the most famous photographer that we have interviewed to date. Let's go to New York City and listen to Bob Gruen's stories. So we're here with Bob Gruen in his studio in New York City. Bob, thanks for joining us. Glad to be here. I, I really appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to sit here and talk and share, the, share your work and your stories with everybody on the website. All right. So <laughs> it was funny. The first time we encountered you, well, I ran into you in South by Southwest about a year uh -huh. and a half ago. Uh -huh. uh, we, we talked. You told me about a documentary that you were working on, and right. I believe they were screening it there. And then a couple years back at the Morrison Hotel Gallery, uh, it was a Jim Marshall opening that he uh, invited us to, and we came uh, out, and then you were there, and at the subway we saw you. We didn't talk, but oh, we figured uh -huh. we saw you there. Uh -huh. So just jumping into this, where where did you start? Uh, well, my mother taught me photography. Actually, when I was very little, uh, it was her hobby. My mom used to develop and print her own pictures. Uh, and when I was like three years old, I was too little to leave running around the house, but too big to go to sleep already, so she took me in the darkroom with her, and uh, it was even before they had daylight tanks, we used to put the film up and down in trays. I guess I'm dating myself here. <laughs> so before, the, the, um, no reels, just trays. Um, yeah, we just, we, uh, you had to keep the, f the film moving through the developer up and down in the trays and count the seconds in the wow. dark. So I'm pretty good at counting seconds. <laughs> and then uh, I, I took a liking to it. And um, by the time I was eight years old, my mom bought me my first camera. And um, I became the family photographer. Nice. <laughs> what, what? And... Um, and I think rock and roll bands are like families, you know, where you got four or five dysfunctional people and you got to get a moment when they all look like they're having a good time together. Yeah. What, uh, what was that first camera? Uh, my first was a Barney Hawkeye. Do you still have it? Uh, yes. Actually, oh. it's downstairs. Oh, well, <laughs> uh, I, uh, I brought you one, actually. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> I didn't know. No, I remember how it works and everything. It's very simple, but very efficient. It works really well. Yeah, I, I, I dug into my archives. I, ha I picked one uh -huh. of these up somewhere. I think I bought this one in Atlanta at some point. Uh -huh. yeah, well, there's loads cool. of them around. It, it was a very popular camera because it's very simple and they always worked. And was it just click and go? Uh, pretty much, but it had one extra feature, which was nice, is that if you pull the... There was a, a, some part of it that you pull it up a little bit and then you could have bulb. It was either the 60th of a second or... It would just stay open, so you could do, um, you know, long time exposures uh, for low light or for. I've know. actually never played with this bad boy. Um, we'll play with it. Not used, not not recently, but I, yeah, yeah. The thing on the left, if you pull that up, this one over here, the the gray switch there, push that oh, up, and then, it, and then it's bulb, and then it'll stay open as long as you hold it down. There you go. So uh, you can do all kinds of experimental things. You know, we did everything where. You know, all the kind of tricks that people had in books in the 50s when I was learning, uh, where a guy stands there and he holds his hand out and somebody else is like, you know, 100 yards behind him and, and looks this big, so somebody's standing in your hand. And right. All kind of optical things like that. And so, uh, double exposures. Because you can do a lot of exposures until you wind it. You know, it doesn't, didn't have an exposure lock, so right. you can do double exposures. And, That's crazy. So, and it has a flash that fits on the side. That, the big um, bulb. has a big bulb, but you had to change the bulb for every shot. It was, uh, and actually, then, when I was 13, I got a, um, a Kodak Pony camera. It was my first 35mm camera. And I was using that, still mostly taking family pictures. But then uh, my parents were part of an organization, well, a couple of organizations. My mom was the leader of a lot of organizations. Um, but when they would have their annual dinner dance, fundraisers or whatever, and people would get all dressed up, I was like the photographer for the, uh, for the event. And, um, and I would sell Polaroids. My mom had a Polaroid camera, so I would take Polaroids and um, you know, sell them for $5. Uh, you know, you put them in a little frame. And it's funny because nowadays it's about the same price. I, I see these guys out in the street every once in a while. I think it's still $5 you yeah. know, for a Polaroid. Um, but I was taking pictures then, and uh, people saw me with my pony camera, and they said, like, you know, they thought I was a kid with his dad's camera, because I was 13, I was kind of skinny little kid. Um, and I went and bought a Crown Graphic, which is a 4x5 press camera, the kind of, you see in all the 1940s and 50s Out on movies. the baseball field. And, uh, yeah, and then all of a sudden they thought I was, like, awfully young to be a photographer, because nobody's dad had that kind of camera, and the only people who had that camera were professional photographers. Sure. So. 
Uh, and from then on, I've, I've been professional. Wow. So, so what, what was your first paying gig? Uh, in photography, uh, when I was 11, I was in summer camp. And using the Brownie Hawkeye, I took pictures of the play that the campers put on. I even remember it was Oklahoma. And, uh, and even then, I, I like to move around in a the theater. I, I was never good at just sitting in my seat. Um, and so I was down front and taking pictures, and I sent the, picture, the film to my mom, and she made prints from it and sent them back, and I sold it to the campers. Wow. And basically, that's still what I'm doing today, taking pictures of people on stage and selling them. Uh, but my mom doesn't develop the film anymore. Yeah. Know? Where's the music? How did you get into that? How did you end up finding yourself working with musicians, not well, just shooting the live shows, but getting backstage? Well, when I was a teenager, they invented rock and roll. You know, I the think perfect I was about timing. 11 when Elvis Presley came out. And, uh, and I really took a liking to it, like most of my friends, everybody that age. Uh, and um, and, I, and I remember seeing Chuck Berry in the early 60s. And um, when I got out of high school, you know, there was that idea of like turn on, tune in, and drop out. And that's what I did. And I lived with a rock and roll band uh, off Times Square. First here in the village, actually, and then in Times Square. And, um, and then when they got a record deal a couple of years later, uh, they, the record company liked the pictures I'd been taking of them. And that was my first press photos that they used that was bought. And um, they started hiring me for more jobs. Uh, that band was called The Glitter House, uh, which had nothing to do with glitter. It was named after a movie, actually. Uh, glitter hadn't really started yet. Uh, the, mm -hmm. They were called The Glitter House like 68, I think. Um, but Bob Crew, the really great uh, record producer, found them, discovered them. And, uh, and actually, their claim to fame, they're on the internet because they... Um, sang the vocals for the movie Barbarella. Mm. And then he made a, a solo album for them and used my pictures. And, and actually, Bob hired me for my first album cover. It was a girl named, uh, it was a back cover, named, uh, a girl named Lottie Golden. I did a, pictures for her. And then um, one night, uh, just by circumstance, uh, I met Ike and Tina Turner. Uh, a friend of ours had told us we had to go see Ike and Tina, that she was amazing. We went and saw him. She was right. The, Tina is one of the most amazing performers ever. And uh, the next time I went, I brought my camera. I remember we were sitting on the floor of a little nightclub in Long Island called the Honka Monka Room. And I was taking pictures of the show. And, um, and one of them came out really, really well. It was kind of a multiple exposure. Because at the end of the Tina's act, she danced off the stage while the strobe light was flashing. And I only had a couple of frames left. but And I had no idea what would happen. Actually... The interesting thing about it is I had no idea what the exposure would be because it was just a strobe light going off. I had no idea where Tina was going to be, where to even point the camera, you know, yeah. and, and, I, and, you know, what's, so I just turned, the, opened the camera for a second and thought I'd get a couple of the flashes and see what would happen. And three of the pictures are not so good, but one of them was excellent. It's kind of like Duchamp's nude on descending the staircase. It just captures the whole pattern of, of Tina's expression and excitement and energy and um, and I brought the pictures a few days later to show my friends when we went to another Ike and Tina show because they played around in the neighborhood when they were here. They played in Long Island and New Jersey and Madison Square Garden with the Stones and then a couple of days later up in Newport. And, and so we went to New Jersey and, um, and I had the pictures to show my friends, as I said. And uh, the dressing rooms, there was a theater in the round, so the dressing rooms were outside. And as we were walking out, we, my friend actually saw Ike Turner going from one dressing room to another and walking past us and literally pushed me in front of Ike and said, show Ike the pictures. And he stopped and he said, what pictures? You know? And I showed him and he liked them and he took me right in the dressing room and showed them to Tina and she loved them. And uh, he, she wanted to see the contacts and she liked all the pictures there, which is pretty unusual. <laughs> you know. And, uh, and pretty soon I started traveling with Ike and Tina Turner and... Uh, about a year later, I had my first album cover with Tina Turner. Wow. That's, all the, that's the photo from the supermarket? Or? Uh, yeah, I was actually in a supermarket. I spent the day with Tina, and uh, I pictured her in a car taking her kids to soccer practice, and then we went uh, shopping at a department store, and then we went to a grocery store. There's, there's a nice picture where she's got loaves of bread in her arms. And, um, and then as we were checking out, I was just taking some pictures of the profile, and one of those profile pictures... At a grocery store cash register, it turned out to be an album cover. Must have had nice uh, window light coming in from the front. Yeah, it was nice and soft. And, and I did a lot of natural work. When I started, I was very opposed to using flash of any kind. Um, I really wanted a natural you know, feeling. I felt that a flash really distorted the reality that you were seeing. Um, but after a while... I was doing party pictures for record companies, and you know, you need to you're do in it. a dark nightclub. You need the flash, and I ended up learning how to use that and getting pretty good at it. And, and nowadays, I like it when 
you know, you're out in the sunlight or something, you can use the flash for a fill light. Uh, it's a lot easier nowadays because um, uh, back then there was a little formula that you had to divide. Each flash unit had a guide number, which was related to how powerful it was, and you had to divide how far away you were from the subject, how many feet by divided by that guide number, and that would tell you the f-stop. And So you had to estimate or measure how many feet away you were. And um, it was pretty complicated. I'll tell you, in the 70s when they invented the TTL flash, it was like a godsend. It was like, you know. You knew you'd get it. For me, that was one of my favorite inventions. <laughs> you know, like air conditioning is pretty good, but the TTL flash, boy, it made my life a lot easier. And it's gotten The fact even... that you could take a color picture and it would come out exposed right. Because black and white, you can, you know, print it a little longer or a little less, kind of, you know, you have some adjustments in the dark room. But with color film, once it's developed, that what you see is what you get. And if you're a quarter stop or a half stop off, it's going to be washed out or too dark and... Uh, I have a lot of pictures like that. <laughs> yeah. Luckily now with Photoshop nowadays, we can fix them. You can do quite a lot on the work we were talking yeah. to your but assistant back then, over here. You know, getting a properly exposed color picture was very difficult. Wow. So I was trying to figure out. I was I was Instagramming a photo that we were coming up here today to talk to you, and I, mm. at first I put concert photographer but then i change it to rock photographer yeah because i feel that you're not just about the live shot it's about getting no it's more about places. the rock and roll lifestyle yeah. yeah and is that is that how you would classify yourself uh rock and roll photographer yeah it, um because to me it's more than just the you know the the moment on stage to me rock and roll is a lifestyle it's all about freedom it's about freedom to express yourself very loudly uh and all the time yeah you know that's why people wear their colors walking down the street and uh, you know people wear t-shirts expressing what band they like so that you see somebody else who likes that band you know you have something in common uh, you know to me rock and roll is, is a lifestyle yeah can you talk about the uh, the way the first time you had your encounter with John and Yoko uh, well yeah there was a couple because uh, first um, they lived around the corner when they came to New York they got an apartment pretty quickly around the corner here uh, and the whole neighborhood knew that they were living there but of course you're not going to stand outside and, and stare at them you know we're new yorkers we're busy we got things to do too and um but then one night i went to a benefit concert at the um apollo theater up on 125th street and there was a benefit for the families of the prisoners who were injured in the attica riots and aretha franklin was going to perform and that's who i went to see and i remember as i came in like things happen in my life in a very lucky way i didn't have to try to make arrangements to get there because the whole week before, for like five or six days, uh, uh, what's the band? Uh, I'm going blank on the name of the band, but there was a, a great band that had been playing there that I was working with. And um, and so all the backstage guys, the door guys knew me because I'd been coming in and out for like five or six days in a row. So I came back two days later and they knew who I was and they let me right in. And I came walking up the aisle and um, it was Gladys Knight and the Pips that I was working with. And I, and I remember walking up the aisle of the Apollo and the announcer going, John Lennon and Yoko Ono, the Plastic Ono Band. And it was like being hit by lightning. Like, oh my God, John Lennon's here and Yoko. And, and I was a huge fan. I always liked John from the Beatles, but um, I'm actually one of the few people who heard about Yoko before I heard about the Beatles. I was reading a magazine called The Realist and I read about a Japanese artist who had rented a loft and they had these large bags in the loft and it cost $5 to go in and you could get in a bag and you could do your thing. <laughs> which was a big hippie expression back then, you know. Uh, or you could get in a bag with somebody and do your thing, do whatever you wanted. and Or you just could go in the loft and wonder what people were doing in these bags that were moving around. And I thought it was one of the oddest, weirdest art exhibits I'd ever heard about. So I remembered it. And then when, I, when John met Yoko, and pretty soon they were into bagism, I thought, that's got to be the same <laughs> oriental artist. I mean, they don't have, you know, that many people into bags, you know. Um, <laughs> But then, uh, anyway, I saw them at the Apollo Theater, and when they were backstage, um, they were waiting for their car, and a few people were standing around and taking snapshots with them. And at one point, and I took a couple of pictures, and at one point, John kind of just said, well, people are always taking our pictures like this, you know, we never get to see them. What happens to all these pictures? And I said, well, I live around the corner from you. I'll show you my pictures. And he said, you live around the corner? I said, yeah. He said, all right, well, then slip them under the door. And uh, I didn't quite slip him under the door because I rang the doorbell. <laughs> I thought maybe, maybe I'll get to see John and Yoko, you know. But I'm not a pushy person. And uh, actually, the door was opened by Jerry Rubin, uh, and that really kind of threw yeah. me. I said, "Oh my God, I've seen him on TV," you know. <laughs> and um, 
And I gave him, I said, I've got some pictures for Johnny Yoko. And he said, are they expecting you? And I said, no, I'll just leave this for them. And that actually impressed him. Years later, I, I talked to Yoko about that, that after we became friends, um, that the fact that I was one of the few people who actually came to the door and gave them something and didn't want anything in return uh, really impressed them. I made it, made a, you know, made them notice, like, who's that guy? <laughs> yeah. um, but then actually a few months later, I met them in a, a hotel with an inter- during an interview. There was a writer who was doing a story about the Elephant's Memory Band and John Yoko recording with the Elephant's Memory as their backup group. And so, uh, they, uh, uh, so he was interviewing them as their producers, basically, and I was taking pictures in the room. And then when we were done, they were getting ready to go to the studio, and I asked if I could go to the studio with them to get some pictures with the band because I like simple pictures that, I mean, simple captions. You know, instead of having one picture of John and Yoko and a caption that says they're working with another picture of this other, the band, you know what I mean? I like to get one picture, here's John and Yoko with the band, that's it, you know? Um, so they said I, I could come with them, and uh, I remember Yoko saying, you know, you better watch out for Phil Spector, he hates photographers, and I was like, oh boy, you know, I yeah. heard about that guy. Um, and so I kind of avoided him all night, and, and actually years later I ended up being friends with him. He's a pretty cool guy, actually. Um, and when he's not drunk, <laughs> but um, but that's, you can say that about anybody. <laughs> sure. Um, and anyway, I, I did take pictures of him that night, and uh, I didn't really think John and Yoko needed my pictures. They were John and Yoko. They were world famous, you know. Uh, so I actually just dropped the pictures at the magazine, and I went off for a couple of weeks with Ike and Tina. And I came home, and one night, very unexpectedly, I, I was coming home. I remember just stopping in a bar for a beer, and and the bar was empty. I stopped in to see if any uh, friends were around, and there weren't. It was practically empty, and I walked a little further into the back, and the drummer from the Elvis Memory was there in the corner, and he saw me, and he jumped up, and he said, man, we've been trying to find you. We want to get the pictures that you took that night. You're the only one who took a picture of the, us, you know, and John and Yoko, the whole band, together, and we want to use it in the album cover. Uh, can you come and meet John and Yoko tomorrow at their house? And I was like, okay, <laughs> sure. And so uh, I made up a bunch more prints that night and went around the corner the next day and um, I met John and Yoko and we sat around all afternoon talking and it turned out we had a similar cynical New York sense of humor and um, they liked me, I liked them and uh, Yoko asked me to come back more often and, and take more pictures and uh, that's what, I, keep, I still do that. And so, <laughs> you know, I'm still friends with Yoko. That's great. It's, I, so the thing there is that you didn't take your camera out to shoot them right away. You got to know them first. Yes. And that's yeah. such a big thing for everybody to remember that you don't just throw a camera in somebody's face, yeah. get to know them, and then they'll, they'll feel comfortable and give you access. Well, Yoko's talked about that. I actually did an interview one time years ago. There was a magazine for a couple of issues called Rock Photo, and they asked us to interview a f- favorite subject. And I interviewed Yoko about the pictures that she took. Um, like she did the picture of uh, John for the Imagine cover, and she's taken a, a few different pictures that I, I liked. And so we talked about it. And she talked about how I have a style where I'm comfortable and, and, and relaxed, and that makes them feel relaxed. And that's why I get pictures of people that look relaxed and comfortable. And that a lot of uh, photographers would come in, and especially with John Yoko, they're very nervous. And they bring assistants in, and they're yelling at the assistants, and they're very nervous, and they're shaky. And that makes the subject shaky and nervous. And, um, and actually, it was an important point, because when I went to meet John and Yoko, um, it was in a hotel where they were doing interviews. They didn't really want the press coming to their house. And I remember when I got there, the interviewer had told me that John and Yoko weren't expecting a photographer. And uh, they were a little cranky. And I said, just wait in the lobby for a little while. And he said, don't worry, they'll wake up and they'll feel better. And you'll, they'll let you come up and you'll take pictures and they'll like your pictures and they'll like you. And you'll probably become friends with them and do album covers for them because <laughs> that's the way they are. And I remember him saying that because that's what happened. Uh, and I said, well, I'll be in the bar. <laughs> you know, let me know when you're ready. And I went in and, um, and he came back 20 minutes later. He said, okay, they're ready. And I came upstairs and I was walking down the hall towards their room. I was shaking. I was like, oh my God, I'm going to meet John and Yoko. It was the most exciting thing I'd ever done in my life. I mean, I can Tina were cool, but this was John and Yoko. <laughs> you know, not even just John Lennon, but John and Yoko, which to me was, you know, a much more powerful connection as a couple, you know, than just John alone. And, um, and I remember stopping in the hallway going, whoa, I, I, I won't even be able to hold my camera. Like, you know, if I'm shaking like this, I won't be able to get any pictures. And I took a deep breath and I said, you know what, my life's okay. And if I meet Johnny Yoko, it'll be better. But if I don't, I'm still okay. And, and I just got to relax and be myself. And there's nothing special I can do. I just have to do what I do. And if they like that, 
then it'll be great. And if they don't, I'll still go on, you know. And and that's what I did. I took up a deep breath. I relaxed. I went in. I do what I do. And they liked it. <laughs> Doesn't get any better than that. No, I was lucky. And then you, you know, ended up being friends for a long time. I'm still friends with Yoko now. That's um, I just saw her a couple of days ago. That's really cool. Um, how have you adapted with the times? You know, everything, camera changes, gears change. Oh, I, I go with the flow. You know, uh, I like change. You know, uh, it, it's interesting. It, it makes things different. Uh, I wouldn't want things to be the same all the time. <laughs> and, um, you know, when the digital cameras came out, it was a little while before they were actually good enough quality to be able to sell a digital picture. Um, so I've been in it since the beginning. And since about 2000, I think... Uh, I've been using the uh, just st- strictly digital. Sure. Because uh, it's just, uh, you know, it's a m- more convenient. And I remember, uh, you know, because in the years when I started, all the time in the beginning, um, you would take pictures, make prints or slides, and then you would send the prints and slides to a magazine. Um, then for a while, you would send prints and slides to a magazine. They would scan them. Nowadays, they don't even have scanners. If you send a print or a slide to somebody, I, I would guess that, Anybody under 25 has never seen a, a transparency, a slide. They don't know what it is. <laughs> yeah, try you know? an inner negative also. Um, yeah, I mean, they have no idea about those kind of te- that old technology. So they just want you to email them a scan. And, uh, you know, you have to get with the program. So even if I was shooting film today, I'd have to make scans to send out. So I shoot scans. I shoot digital. Yeah, we were talking earlier with your assistant uh, about the archive. Mm-hmm. He said the negatives are kept in a vault. Yeah. You've... Uh, made a lot of prints did you have any copy negs of those uh not really i mean copy negs aren't the same thing i have a lot of prints so if we needed to we could copy a print uh at this point we have a lot of scans yeah uh, all my best work has been scanned we're constantly scanning more and more because we keep getting requests for more and more because uh, the history of the 70s is something that people find really interesting so we're always getting requests for documentaries magazines books and uh, so we're always making new scans, and that's a good backup is the good scans. Sure. With yeah. image rights, it's a big thing today that mm. a lot of musicians want you to sign the piece of paper that says they can call you at any point and use your images and, right. and all that. You, do you own the rights to everything you've taken? Well, they didn't have those contracts back then, no. you know, and fortunately nobody wanted to pay for a buyout. You know, every once in a while, somebody would be hired for an album cover shoot or something, and it would be a buyout. But then you get like twenty, thirty thousand dollars or something, or at least five or ten. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I never was offered that kind of money. I was working for one hundred and fifty, two hundred dollars. Uh, so it was just use of the photos for publicity, and it was always just a license. And so I own my copyrights. Uh, I mean, it's a funny thing. A friend of mine had a friend who, in England who was a photographer, and she was giving him advice, and he was getting a, you know, being offered a job, and. I think it was ten thousand dollars or something, and uh, and they were offering a buyout. You know, they wanted to own everything, and she was telling him like Bob Gruen would never sell all the rights to his pictures. And I said, "Are you kidding? For ten thousand bucks, I would have done it in a second. You know, maybe not nowadays, but back then certainly I would have. Sure, you know, it was a, uh, today. It's, I would have jumped at the chance. I wish somebody had offered me that. That would have been a lot of money back then. Yeah, but um, but fortunately, I own the copyright for all my pictures. Around the eighties, they came up with the idea of the contracts. Uh, which is a very misunderstood idea. Um, what was happening was that merchandise was worth more than contact, co- concert tickets. I remember uh, one of the guys who came up with the idea of the contract uh, was managing a band. In 86, he told me that they were selling more merchandise, you know, more value. They were selling like $20 worth of merchandise for every $10 in tickets. And that the merchandise was more important. And they wanted to stop bootlegging. They were very upset about people selling T-shirts or, and posters, you know, outside the concert in the parking lot and so on. And they felt that if they controlled the photography, they would control the bootlegging. Right. And when I talked to them, I said, you know, a bootlegger has never, ever paid me for a photo. I don't know any bootlegger who's gotten a photo from a, a legitimate photographer. And by restricting the legitimate photography... They restrict the use of, you know, their press photos, which are, you know, they're not paying for this free press. And they try to control that in ways that they don't really understand. You know, uh, I had a Guns N' Roses once had a contract that you had to sign the contract so that you could take whatever pictures you wanted of the show, only the first three songs, of course, uh, and then give them the film with instructions if you wanted. They would develop the film. They would pick out one picture that they approved give that to you to use one time for your magazine, and then they would keep all the rest of the pictures and they would own them. 
Very and nice. if they wanted to use them for whatever they wanted, it was theirs. So uh, I think it was only Rolling Stone magazine that really needed to have a picture of them in their magazine and was willing to sign the contract. All the other photographers walked off. Because I, I remember uh, talking to Jim Marshall about something like that once. Oh, Jim. <laughs> and I think it pr- probably ended with uh, a gun or something. You know? yeah, I can't imagine Jim signing away anything. Uh, you know, he was old school. Well, it was funny. I was talking to Robert Knight when we were out in uh, uh, Vegas, and he was telling me a story. When he goes and signs contracts, he puts Jim Marshall's name down. Oh, really? Yeah, he doesn't even... <laughs> yeah, argue with Jim. <laughs> he's like, uh, he puts down Jim Marshall's name now. Well, I used to just sign Frank Sinatra, actually. There we go. There's another Because the one. interesting thing about those contracts is I've never seen one after I signed it. Yeah, exactly. They, they, they tend to disappear into a file. I don't know any photographer who's ever been called out on a use, if you use it for five magazines instead of one, whatever the contract says... I've never seen because bootleggers don't use legitimate photographers' photos. Yeah. They use the free picture that they get from the record company, which is the most popular one, which, which is, is the one the fans want to see. Yeah. It's the one the fans recognize as the look of the artist, and they get that for free from the record company. Yeah. So why would they pay a photographer to bootleg a picture? You know, uh, but it's become such a standard in the industry that they make out these contracts say you can only use this photo one time for one magazine and you have to sign here or we won't let you in front of the stage and you can only be out there for three songs. Uh, myself, if I only had three songs, I'd rather have the last three exactly. than the first three because by the last three, the whole audience is up and happening, all the lights are on, the band is giving their all, they're really doing it. I'd much rather shoot an encore than an opening because in the opening, the band is running back and forth trying to get everybody's attention. Yep. And, uh, and they only have half their lighting because they're saving the effects for later. And, and especially now, they escort you out of the theater. I mean, I got into rock and roll because I'm a fan. You know, I was living with a band. I, I was, I'm a fan of rock and roll. I, I, I go to the show to see the show, and I take pictures so I can pay for my life of seeing shows. Yeah. But when you have to leave after the first three songs, that's ridiculous. Yeah. You know? do, you, do you know any of the origins of the three-song rule? I believe it started... Uh, Either with the Rolling Stones or with Bob Dylan. Uh, I remember early on, the Rolling Stones had a three-song rule where they just didn't want a mob of photographers in front of the stage the whole time. And especially back then, people used to use flash because the color film wasn't very sensitive. And, um, and so after three songs, they figured you got enough and they you know, made the photographers leave the pit, yeah, not the theater. And I generally didn't even walk out to the side where you're stuck out on the edge of the thing. I would just jump over the barrier, and I was right there in front, and I stayed there all night. And oh. I did that a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's tough now. It's yeah. tough. And I was reading about the, the way you, know, you got... No, now they, they want you right out of the theater. Oh, they'll, they'll force you out. They'll, yeah. they'll get physical. Cause so I rarely take any concert pictures anymore. Um, I work with Green Day because they like me, and they let me shoot the whole show. I have total access with them. Uh, but very... F- I, I don't even. I can't think of any other bands I shoot nowadays. And you think they, they they'd give you those restrictions today? Uh, other bands, yeah. You know, people think I have a gold card because I'm Bob Gruen and I have a reputation. I don't have any gold card. Uh, publicists, you know, some of. I mean, some of them know me and try to help me out and they're nice to me, but others don't even you know think that far and rules is rules and they can't break them for somebody you know <laughs> oh the rules yeah you know. i love those rules right yeah no i, was, I hate rules you, you, you try to find your way backstage anyway uh well yeah i mean i don't intrude you know i don't try to sneak backstage i never tried to sneak anywhere you know? and and uh doorman let me in quite often because uh i usually don't show up unless i'm supposed to be there you and know, they didn't need to babysit I, yeah. you, like somebody on the back door going, oh, I'm trying to see the band. You would talk yeah. to the proper people first and just right. just get there. Right. So I remember right. when, I, when I first started out, it was, I, I'd walk past the artist in the hallway sometime backstage, mm. and I'd just say hi, and I wouldn't stop them to, to say, hey, yeah. is it all right if I do this? I would go, can you tell me where your tour manager is? Yeah. So I'd go talk to the tour manager, yeah. then I'd show him a book of work, because yeah. that was before iPhones, and we'd show him the work, yeah. and then... They'd be like, oh, we've toured with these guys. Oh, we love this. You know yeah, what? Let me yeah. talk to them and we'll let you do whatever you want. It's always better to go through the right channels and explain who you are and try to make some kind of personal connection. Uh, it is difficult getting photo passes, um, you know, because they can't just let everybody come down in the front. Yeah. So um, they have to restrict it somehow. I understand that, you know. Now, did you have a favorite tour that you've been on? Uh, well, I enjoyed being with The Clash very much, and I, I went with them three times across America. <laughs> um, it's hard for me to make a favorite. I really, I don't really make lists. You sure. know, hanging out with Ike and Tina Turner is an awful lot of fun. 
Um, I don't recommend kids try that at home, though. <laughs> <You> <laughs> know, I, but I got quite an education. Uh, unfortunately, John and Yoko never toured. Uh, when Just before John passed away, we had a long con- My last conversation with him, he was talking about finishing the Double Fantasy album and uh, putting the next one together and then getting a band. And by the spring, we were supposed to go on tour together around the world. Hmm. And I was really looking forward to that. But it never happened. Oh, that's a shame. Um... What else did I have? Oh, you have a documentary being released shortly? Oh, yeah. Um, I don't know when this is going to air, but uh, starting June 12th, uh, June 13th on Showtime, uh, there's a documentary that Don Letts made about me. It's called Rock and Roll Exposed, and it's uh, a really good film. It's Rock and Roll Exposed, the photography of Bob Gruen. Uh, it features Iggy Pop and Alice Cooper, Debbie Harry, Yoko Ono, uh, Jesse Malin's in it, Billy Joe Armstrong, uh, Tommy Ramone. Uh, a whole bunch of people, Legs McNeil, Lenny Kay, all talking about rock and roll photography, how image, you know, how they relate to the image, how they grew up seeing images and, and you know, getting inspiration from rock and roll images. And uh, and my photography, I'm in it a lot too. It's, it's all about my career. How's that feel? Uh, and that starts on June 13th and it runs for about two or three weeks. I'll definitely be watching. How does it feel to have this... You know, you, you were there to capture the artist because mm. you loved music and you loved photography and you put it together. And now they turn it around. They're taking the work that you captured. It's kind of incredible and it's very val- you know, validating because most of my life uh, I was, you know, a rock and roll outcast. Uh, you know, I was just drunk all night in clubs and it didn't look like I was doing very much of anything good. And now I'm legendary. <laughs> and somebody the last week called me esteemed. Which um, and I have, I have a book that's been published. My John Lennon book's been published in five languages. I'm going mm-hmm. to Buenos Aires next week for the release of the Spanish edition, mm-hmm. uh, and I'm pinching myself. I can't believe like how my life turned out because I worked very low budget, very long hours, uh, 24/7. I was out all day dropping off pictures and finding out what was going on and working all night taking pictures. And then I'd be out drinking with my friends, you know, musicians, and I would drop them off and come home and develop the film and start making prints and get them out the next day. And uh, and all of that hard work seems to have paid off that um, people are actually recognizing it nowadays. The networking. Yeah. That's, that's the biggest thing I got from reading the books that you have is that you would meet one person, that would lead to more, lead to it's others. It's just been like a, a chain reaction. That One thing always just leads to the other. I never know from one day to the next where I'm going to be or what's going to happen. And I just keep running into people uh, very spontaneously and... And things just working out, you know. I mean, I always try to make the best of it. Uh, I remember we, I, we were out with Malcolm McLaren one night, and uh, my wife asked him, you know, what's your plan? What was your plan? Like, how did you accomplish so much, you know, when you started out? What was your plan? And Malcolm and I kind of looked at each other like, plan? <laughs> like, we didn't really have plans back then. And Malcolm summed it up really well. He said, well, you go to sleep at night, and you have some plans of what you think you're going to do the next day. And then you wake up in the morning, and the phone rings. And, or nowadays you get an email and things change and you go with the flow and you make the best of every day you know that's, that's, that's perfect I think we should uh, call today there I'm sure okay. we could talk for hours but okay. thank you very much for uh, joining us it's my pleasure thanks for coming by so there you have it guys what a fantastic interview the stories of how he got out with Ike and Tina Turner and how he was in the right places and how things he put himself in the right place with meeting people and then networking and going all over to make the jobs happen like shooting in the morning or doing a photo shoot in the afternoon at the record company then shooting another show here for somebody and then going to the late show somewhere else uh, to shoot more just he got seen and he had quality work, and he asked for it. It's just really awesome, 34-minute-long interview that we had there. There is that documentary that he talked about that's going to be on Showtime. It's not going to be on demand, but I encourage you to record it and share it with your friends so that people can see it because it's worth seeing. I haven't seen it yet. Uh, it, it It's going to be out by the time that this is up, so check Showtime for your local listings uh, for that documentary on Bob Gruen and his work. Um, also, check out the books that he has on on Amazon the links are over on the website and really it's just it's a very inspirational thing and the 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 stories I find are just amazing and fantastic uh to hear so that is about it don't forget about that Antonelli Institute hour and a half long really really awesome discussion that I had with the whole graduating class actually the whole school listened to me talk for an hour and a half and it was really 
really good. So the only way you're going to be able to get that when it's released is to be a subscriber. I recommend subscribing there on iTunes so that it can go on your phone and on your computer and all of those things like that. I also want to thank Rokinon for this week. They were a sponsor this week. Check out the, those lenses. I know Alan's camera has them. I'm looking forward to using them. We're going to start using them on the podcast uh, because they the, the Cine lenses are fantastic, affordable, and quality lenses. You can't go wrong for the prices that they have uh, and the quality that they're offering because some, some cinema lenses are extremely expensive from other companies and, and sometimes... Yeah, you just need to check out these other Rokinon ones for what they offer because you may find that it's great for shooting video. Oh, they even have those fish eyes for those people that love doing fish eye stuff. You can check out their fish eye lenses. Uh, they're all manual focus. So check them out, and that's it. Steven, thanks you. Thanks you. Steven, thank you for your news. You're welcome, too. Uh, all those news stories are over on fronosphoto.com. Click the link that is either on the screen or below here on YouTube. If you're listening to the podcast, go to fronosphoto.com slash podcast. You can see all of the podcasts that we've had and also all the news there is copied there. And during the week, we do release a photo news that Steven does. It's a photo news preview. It runs about a minute and a half to two minutes, just giving you guys the like four or five stories to, to think about and then you can click over if you'd like to read more about any specific one we try to give you just the cliff notes really quick so that you can make your mind up of what you want to listen to and there you have it big thanks to bob gruen thank you for ari for going up with me uh to new york city to do the recording and the videoing really fantastic interview i hope you guys enjoyed it that's it jared poland froknowsphoto.com see ya